So again, welcome to the third of the Archaeology Cafes here in Phoenix. And I'm Bill Dowley, the president of Archaeology Southwest. So tonight's speaker is Pat Stein. And I, I'm not going to tell a lot of stories, but I, I do want to say how long <clears throat> ago I first met Pat. It was in 1972 down in Tehuacan Valley, Mexico. Uh, we were both on a project back there. Um, and then not a lot of contact or interaction for several years. And then coming off the airplane of going to the Dallas Society for American Archaeology meetings in 1975, there was Pat again. And at those uh, meetings, she interviewed with uh, Paul Fish, I believe, for uh, from the Museum of Northern Arizona, got a job there and moved to Arizona, and has had a whole series of subsequent jobs. <clears throat> and I think uh, the key point uh, was setting up her own Arizona Preservation, uh, Arizona, sorry. Yes, Arizona Preservation Consultants, sorry. Um, and she's done some absolutely wonderful research. She's one of the I called her my historian culture hero, as we were talking to folks earlier on here. Pat is, just does wonderful research, and she's going to share some of that with us here tonight. Uh, the, the fancy title is Land of Schemes, or Fields of Schemes, Lincoln Fowler's Canal and Farm on the Gila River Indian Reservation. So an early land development uh, idea here in the great state of Arizona, which has had many of those things. So Pat, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Sorry for the noise there. Uh, I don't give many public talks. Um, I asked some of my friends to watch the previous Archaeology Cafe tapes and give me some pointers on public speaking. And they came up with things like, don't stand in front of the frog, or it looks like the frog is eating your head, or you've got oh, some kind of Medusa thing going on. Um, wear big shoes so they can see you at the back. And don't hyperventilate, swallow air, and burp into the microphone. Um, these are my friends, by the way. Um, but the best tip I, I picked up was to have an outline. So please excuse me if I do refer to the outline from time to time to prevent this from being a complete train wreck. Um, I'll also have to look at my watch from time to time because uh, there's no clock in here and I want to kind of keep on schedule and leave time at the end for some questions from you all. So tonight the subject of my talk is Lincoln Fowler in the Field of Schemes, the irrigation project that he had on the Gila River Indian Reservation. If you've driven through uh, the Gila River Indian Reservation, you've probably seen large agricultural operations. And you might be surprised to learn that many of them are uh, operated by people outside the reservation, by non-Indians. And Lincoln Fowler was certainly a non-Indian, and he was the first on the reservation, on that reservation, um, to start one of these lease farms. Uh, Lincoln Fowler, uh, let's see. Well, the farm is located on the Gila River Indian Reservation, which was founded in 1859 uh, for the Pima, Mar Pima Maricopa Indians, Pima and Maricopa Indians. It was originally 25 miles long by four miles wide, and it kind of meandered along the middle, middle of the, the middle Gila River. It was expanded to its present size of um, about, well, a little over 350,000 acres through various executive orders. And the part of the reservation I'm talking about tonight was expanded uh, through an executive order that was passed in 1883. Uh, the part of the reservation I'll be talking about is called the northern borderlands of the reservation. Uh, the Indians refer to it as Skokhavik which uh, refers to a flat volcanic butte that, or mesa that's in the middle of it. And where this is, is um, if you were standing on South Mountain looking south, you would see at the base of the hill, the Awatuki foothills, 
and then you would see Pecos Road, and Pecos Road forms a, a sharp demarcation between um, the developed off Indian part of that area and the Indian Reservation, which is just to the south, where there's, um, there's virtually no subdivisions, etc. And uh, this is the area I'll be talking about. Uh, archaeologists have done quite a few surveys done in that area of the northern borderlands, and they found that the area pretty much lacks large habitation prehistoric sites like Snake Town, but it has many small limited activity sites, uh, such as um, uh, quarrying sites on Black Butte, which is the, the volcanic formation that sticks up there, and uh, hunting gathering sites, and also dry farming sites. Um, my involvement in the project came about uh, through the Pima Maricopa Irrigation Project, which has been going on for a number of years. And that's a program that is sponsored by the tribe now, the Gila River Indian Community. And it's a project to essentially put, uh, rebuild and reinstall the irrigation system so it can be more efficient on the reservation. And during the course of uh, archaeological studies for that project, and the project is huge. It's like 82 miles of main stem canal and 2,400 miles of secondary canals. And these areas have been surveyed, and the archaeologists have found many sites along them, uh, including a couple of sites along this particular area that are uh, was called Site 1104 and Site 649. Uh, site 1104, uh, they determined uh, the Cultural Resource Management Program of the Gila River Indian Community, determined through interviewing tribal elders and doing some preliminary archival study that this was a work camp associated with the earliest lease farm on the reservation, a farm that was organized by Mr. Lincoln Fowler. So um, as part of their archaeological research on this camp and, and farm and site, uh, they, uh, Andy, Andy Darling, who was formerly with you in the Indian community in the Cultural Resource Management Program, uh, did some studies and he, he had done some archival research and he had done a preliminary report on, um, on the canal that irrigated the farm and on the work camp. And uh, Andy, being a very competent person, was moved up in his organization until he got to be the head of the cultural resource management section. And it was essentially an administrative job, and he had very little time to do research and writing. So um, they asked me to come in and kind of do some more research and tidy up the report. Um, and I submitted the report about the canal and the farm and a little bit about the site. Um, I submitted that report back in January. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. The, the entire re report covered the whole history of that farm from pretty much from 1917 up to, well, the present. But tonight I'll just be talking about how a lease farm run by outsiders got started on the reservation. Well, who was Lincoln Fowler? Uh, if you've done work in Arizona history, you may have come across his name and then found very little about him. He's kind of a mysterious figure in some ways, uh, despite being very active around the turn of the 20th century. And there's three pictures of Mr. Fowler on the, on the cover of your handout. Someone suggested that, that the third one, the one of him in his 60s, uh, looks like the character that Monopoly is based on. <laughs> And that, um, well, that might not have been far from the mark on what his character was like. Uh, he's described in, in his obituary as a person of very strong will and indomitable spirit, a stoic and determined character who got things done. His family background uh, helps to describe or helps to explain his involvement in agriculture. He was born in 1861 to a family in San Bernardino, California that was very prominent and prosperous in the sheep ranching business. 
His parents were Franklin M. Fowler and Rosaline Fowler. And in 1875-76, the Fowlers were suffering the effects of the drought in California, and they decided to drive their sheep van to Arizona, central Arizona around the Verde River Valley. So they began the trek, the father, Franklin, with two of his sons, uh, Lincoln being one of them, and seven sheep herders. And they arrived in Arizona with only a thousand of their sheep left. So it must have been quite, quite a trip to go from 5,000 down to 1,000. They settled initially along the Verde River Valley, the lower Verde River Valley. Um, and Franklin uh, had a kind of a hard time reestablishing himself, but that's exactly what he did. He got back into sheep ranching in a big way, um, helped to develop some canals in the Verde River Valley and also uh, the Salt River Valley started a butchering business, uh, diversified in several ways. Uh, let's see, got into what else? Um, well, he reunited his family on four sections of land that were about seven miles west of, Black, uh, west of Phoenix, the Phoenix town site. Uh, planted the first fruit trees, uh, developed a massive farm, and by 1887, the Arizona Republican newspaper was calling him <coughs> the largest agricultural operation in the territory. So he became quite prosperous. Um, now, shortly after he arrived in Arizona, Arizona Territory, Lincoln Fowler suffered a terrible accident that provide some insight into his character and what a stoic character he was. When Lincoln was still in his teens, and this was sometime between about 1876 and 1880, uh, he and his brother were tending some of the family sheep on the lower Burden River Valley. And uh, the story was, the official story was, there was a gunshot wound, from a gunshot wound, Lincoln lost his right hand. Well, his brother later published an account of what really happened. It turns out the boys were, had found a little pool of water that had a lot of fish in it. And they decided that they would go fishing with explosives. So, you know, boys will be boys. And, and Lincoln was about to toss a fuse into the pond of water where the fish were when it exploded and it took most of his hand. Uh, a doctor from Fort McDowell helped to patch him up. He was in the hospital for about two weeks with his injury and the amputation of the rest of his hand. And the story was that not a single time during that ordeal did he groan or complain or, or cry out. And this was taken as a great sign of a stoic character. And I think that, that sort of stoicism helped him through life and all his endeavors. Well, when the, he, Lincoln next tried his hand at his remaining hand. At, uh, uh, <laughs> he, tried his, his, he tried his hand at freighting. His father had also been in the freighting business, so he got into that, tried it, but it didn't work out very well. And he seemed to apprentice himself to his father, who was working more in agriculture. He had a, the big farm going on that was west of Phoenix. And um, in 1884, at the tender age of 23, Lincoln ran for a seat on the territorial legislature on a platform that uh, said that the territory should be trying to enlist the federal government to develop large-scale irrigation and water storage projects. And Lincoln was one of the first people in the territory to advocate federal involvement in irrigation projects. So he was a man ahead of his time. Well, he lost the election, uh, but went on to serve on many boards of irrigation companies in the Salt River Valley and the Gila River Valley, down around Florence and Phoenix and Tempe. And by the time he launched his project on the Gila River Indian Reservation in, ag in irrigation and in irrigated agriculture, he had over a quarter century of experience in agribusiness agri and large-scale private irrigation projects. Um, 
Let's see. Well, the father died, uh, Franklin died in 19, no, in 1889. And he left his considerable fortune to his five sons, one daughter and his wife. The five sons joined together to form the Fowler Company, which had really diversified interests and a lot of money initially. And their articles of incorporation that they filed in 1891 said that they would um, conduct um, trading, engage in real estate, uh, agriculture, mining, uh, all kinds of things, even money lending. And in addition to serving on the board of that group, of the Fowler Company, uh, and also being a stockholder, Lincoln Fowler found time for a lot of other pursuits. Let's see, he served on many Republican Party uh, positions for the, for the territory of Arizona. He founded the, let's see, he was on the first Phoenix Water Commission, Water Works Commission. Um, he got permission from the city of Flagstaff, uh, city of Phoenix, excuse me, I'm from Flagstaff and I keep putting that in, from the city of Phoenix to uh, create a streetcar system out to the Fowler neighborhood, which is west of town. He never built that though. And he helped to incorporate something like 98 mining companies, some of them as far away as Alaska. And this was during the uh, Alaska Gold Rush, Klondike Gold thing. He also uh, found time to found the Phoenix Melon Growers Association. Um, what else? Oh, I guess that was about it. Uh, but through his contacts, he got to be well connected with the rich and powerful in the territory and also the up and coming in the territory. Uh, he was a member of the Arizona Club, an august group, really an interesting group, where a lot of deals were struck between men. It was a men's club. It was formed about 1906. And um, it's kind of where men, I gather, would sit around in big leather chairs, smoking cigars and striking deals. But a lot of prominent members of the territory were members of that club early on. So he was a member too. In 1904, he joined with some of his, the people that he had met through his contacts to form the Appropriators Canal Company. And their plan was to clean out the head of the Grand Canal, which had been destroyed in an 1891 flood, and uh, rig it up to an irrigation system that would irrigate uh, many fields on the north side of the Salt River. Well, um, they got that going, and just a year later, they were able to deliver the first water to the farmers along that canal system. But the year following that, 1906, Lincoln Fowler was, um, well, some stockholders in the company suspected some financial irregularities in the company. And what was called the Fowler regime, controlling the company, was ousted from the Appropriators Canal Company. Following that debacle, I guess you'd call it, in 1906, um, little appeared about Lincoln Fowler in the newspapers of the day. But uh, his thoughts seemed to turn during that period, uh, from about 1906 to 1916, to thoughts of hunting, which was one of his original passions. And he had this plan to stock of Arizona Territory with all sorts of African game varieties. And he enlisted the names of, uh, he enlisted the support of some prominent people of the day in uh, big game hunting and um, conservation of animals. Um, among them, Major Fred Burnham, who was instrumental in uh, conserving the uh, desert bighorn sheep in Arizona. And he got his support. But ultimately, um, as you probably figured out, Arizona was spared the likes of the uh, African kudu and the diptych and the springbok and varieties like that. Uh, but Lincoln continued his interest in farming and, and, and rather hunting. And eventually that, that interest in hunting brought him to the northern borderlands of the Gila River Indian Reservation. And when he was there, his thoughts began to wander away from the hunting of 
well, from fauna as its quarry to farmland. Um, about 1916-1917 was the year that he is supposed to have conceived this grand plan to develop a lease farm on the Gila River Indian Reservation. Ooh, where's the time going? Um, and his, his proposal to do a lease farm had four components. The water would come from the Tempe drainage ditch, or Tempe drainage canal. The land would come from Indian allotments. The labor would be supplied by a combination of white sharecroppers, Native American laborers, and maybe Mexican laborers, although that's not too clear. And finally, the economic incentive, kind of propelling this all forward, was the wartime prices that were being paid for cotton. Cotton was experiencing a real boom as the war in, in Europe escalated, and eventually the United States would get pulled into it as well. But cotton was the real economic factor driving this. So the first issue, uh, the question of where to get the water, uh, had developed from a problem <coughs> in, um, in drainage. For the early 20th century, farmers in the Tempe district had noticed that their farms were becoming waterlogged through years of um, uncontrolled, not very well controlled irrigation. The land was becoming waterlogged, the, the water was evaporating, it was making the soil more alkaline. And even poor crops of alfalfa couldn't be grown very well down there. So the logical solution seemed to be to build an irrigation, a system to drain uh, these waterlogged fields. And the solution appeared in 1914 when Maricopa County Drainage District Number 1 was formed. Um, and two years later, the drainage district started to install a giant drainage system called the Tempe Drainage Canal that drained the water from these waterlogged lands. And it began at the Western Canal in Tempe. It continued south for about five miles, and then it dumped all the effluent on the Gila River Indian Reservation, creating a swampland or marsh. Well, this situation could not have been unanticipated, and it's very likely that the people who were planning the Maricopa County Irrigation District, uh, drainage district, were also involved in setting up the Fowler lease and were connected enough from Washington that they could kind of pull this into a, a package and arrange for the water to be used productively when it got to the reservation. And Lincoln Fowler is cre credited with coming up with this notion that he could use the irrigation water to, to irrigate lands on the reservation, but he really couldn't have done it without the help of three key individuals one of them being uh, U.S. Representative Carl Hayden, who later became a senator, um, but he helped facilitate the project from Washington. And then um, Cato Sells, who was the, at the time, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs in Washington. And third, um, Frank Zachary, who was the head of the Pima Agency of the Office of Indian Affairs at Sacramento on the reservation when this project was first conceived. A really critical movement that happened was that Cato Sill, the Indian commissioner, came out from Washington in September of 1917, and he filed for all the water rights that came through the Tempe drainage ditch. And he secured those water rights for the United States government for the use, uh, by, for the use in irrigating Indian lands. And that proved critical. Meanwhile, Fowler got to work on creating his canal that ran roughly parallel to Pecos Road and south of it to irrigate this crack that he was envisioning. Um, <coughs> let's see. Um, but just as he was uh, about to complete his canal, and he worked on his canal from, oh, June of 1917 to about June of 1918, just when he was completing the canal, he noticed that the levels of water in the Tempe drainage canal were dropping. 
and he investigated and found out that two men uh, named Henry Watson and Carol Spicer had diverted the water in the well, of the water in the ditch above the reservation and were using it to irrigate their own lands. <coughs> so the federal government jumped right on this and they prevented, they, they got a temporary halt at least through the diversion of these waters. And uh, let's see. Uh, so that's the, the diversion of the water stopped, but it took a court case of uh, decision by the circuit court in Prescott to determine that these men were not entitled to the water. It was an interesting case because they had filed for water rights from the, the Tempe drainage ditch um, while they were still constructing. Uh, they were the contractors, by the way, who had built this thing. Uh, they filed for water rights from the canal in, um, let's see, I think it was February and April of 1917. But the critical piece of information was that they hadn't started to actually divert the water from the ditch until after the federal government had filed for the water rights on that. So ultimately, the Prescott courts decided that they, they had to stop using all water from that ditch. And the men were ordered to uh, repair the canal where they had breached it and to not take any further water from it. So that was the first ingredient, the water situation in um, Fowler's plan for the irrigated farm on the Gila River Indian Reservation. The second issue involved getting uh, land for the project. And for this, he used Indian allotted land. Allotment had started on the Gila River Indian Reservation in 1887. Well, it hadn't started there. Allotment in general nationally had started in 1887 through the Dawes Act. It didn't get started on the Gila River Indian Reservation for various reasons until 1914. It was conducted mainly between 1914 and 1920. And under the Allotment Act, every man, woman, and child on the reservation received 10 acres of primary uh, irrigated land, well, irrigable land uh, that was supposed to be suitable for agriculture and also 10 acres of uh, secondary land that was supposed to be suitable for um, grazing, basically. Uh, and what, what Fowler would do was work in consort with the uh, agency officials at the Pima Agency to bundle uh, 250 conti contiguous 10-acre units into a 25-acre, one single 25-acre farm. Now this was done, um, the, the consolidation process, it was called unitization, uh, where they would take all these various single allotments and unitize them into a single farmable area. And when Commissioner Sells had come out to establish water rights for the reservation in 1917, he also ordered uh, the allotting agent to cancel the allotments that had been made in the area of Fowler's Farm because they had been let out as secondary grazing allotments and then to reissue all of these as primary <laughs> irrigable uh, farming allotments. So once that was done, um, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, the, the, um, the agent, the Indian agent on the reservation began to unitize these, these um, different allotments into this 2,500 acre farm. And he did that through various leases. He issued 250 leases, which stated uh, the Indian's name, the allotter, uh, no, it's the allottee, or the lessor, and then Lincoln Fowler's name as the lessee, and it would describe how many acres were involved, and it would provide a legal description of where the particular 10-acre allotment was situated. But interestingly enough, on this first round, there was no provision made for the Indian um, having any say, either signing off on anything. It was just kind of done for them in this paternal attitude at the time that the um, 
Office of Indian Affairs to just act on behalf of the Native Americans. Uh, meanwhile, there was a, an extensive contract that was drawn up with uh, Fowler, and he was expected to, under the contract with the Office of Indian Affairs, he was expected to pay $1.25 per acre per year to rent the land. Um, he was expected to put in two irrigation wells because it was hoped that eventually uh, the water, more and more of the water would come from the irrigated source. Uh, would come from wells rather than from the Tempe drainage canal. Um, he was expected to fence the exterior boundaries of this big farming unit. Um, he was expected to post a bond, so if he couldn't complete his obligations, he, uh, his bondsman would step in and complete those obligations for him. And most significantly, I think, he was expected to cultivate at least 85% of every one of these 10-acre tracts within his 25-acre uh, farm, 2,500-acre farm. And at the end of his contract, which was scheduled to expire in 1926, he was expected to turn over an irrigation system and his whole farm to the Office of Indian Affairs uh, expected to turn over a, a good irrigation system in good working order. And this, I think, was critical. This was the big expectation of the times, that here was an outsider who would step in, develop an irrigation system, and then at the end of the contract, he would move on, and the Alatis, the Native Americans, would come in and begin to farm the land. Well, the contract, his father's contract with the federal government just kind of stalled. Although it didn't stall him working on the land, but it did stall. And finally, he asked um, Henry Ashurst, Senator um, Henry Ashurst from Arizona, and also Carl Hayden and Cato Sells to step in and expedite the matter, which, and they finally did that in 1920. Um, part of the problem for the stall was that the Indian agents kept changing on the reservation, and paperwork got stalled, and one thing and another. But even though there was this big stall, it didn't, uh, didn't deter Lincoln Fowler from moving ahead and doing what was ex expected of him. Uh, he put in a couple of irrigation wells and put in some pumps at them. He fenced the exterior boundaries. Um, let's see, he posted a bond. He did several things that he was supposed to do. He, he let's see, cultivated about 800 acres in 1918. Uh, he, he kept increasing the cultivation, and by 1920, he had about 2,250 acres under cultivation. Uh, he couldn't have succeeded in getting his canals in and cultivating all his land without the third ingredient of his formula uh, for the farm, and that was the labor issue. He, uh, on your handout, you'll see an ad that he placed uh, in the paper to try to get sharecroppers to go into this venture with him. It's not clear how many sharecroppers he was actually able to, to get through his ad, but he did use Indian labor. We're pretty sure of that. Uh, it seems that he might not have used Mexican labor at the time, although that's not exactly known. But he did use Native American labor and provided them with an outside source of income. This was consistent with some of the Office of Indian Affairs policies at the time that were encouraging um, the development of outside sources of income for Native Americans to make them more dependent on a cash economy. Uh, Lincoln Fowler established a uh, work camp pretty much in the center of his, uh, his farm. And there's a picture of, on the last page of your handout, there's a couple of pictures of the work camp uh, that were taken about 1930. And this provided laborers with a place to stay. It seemed like it was a pretty good, at least by the 1930s, it was a pretty, pretty good work camp as conditions went back in those days for our field laborers. Um, so the fourth ingredient of Lincoln's big plan, Lincoln Fowler's big plan for irrigated agriculture, was that he was going to make a killing by selling cotton during wartime. 
And during World War I, there was an increased demand for long staple cotton that was used in, uh, particularly in tires for vehicles of various kinds. And uh, a lot of the extra long staple cotton varieties have been developed right there on the Gila River Indian Reservation at Sacatone at the experimental station. Uh, at the beginning of the war, I think there were only about, in, in Maricopa County, for example, there were only a few thousand acres that were being devoted to the growth of cotton, but by the end of the war, there were like about 182,000 acres being devoted just to cotton. And cotton took up about three quarters of the irrigated uh, land in Maricopa County. So great was the demand for cotton. Well, the war ended. And suddenly, Lincoln's, Lincoln Poe's plans to become a daddy war box just kind of evaporated with the end of the war. And he was around 1921, found himself in a pretty crisis situation. Um, he began to um, cut back on his irrigated area, but he apparently couldn't cut the, the stem of water to it from the Tempe drainage canal. The superintendent of the agency at, at Sacaton, the Indian agency, cautioned him that he should, oh, he should um, cut the flow of water because if he was watering the area but not cultivating it, the alkalinity was going to build up. And that indeed happened. Um, and uh, he was also finding, Lincoln Fowler was also finding that uh, um, the subject of uh, water was becoming a lot more complicated and costly. Uh, in 1923, the Leviathan, known as the Salt River Valley Water Users Association, acquired the Tempe drainage canal and began to manage it. And they, um, they used the, dr the Tempe drainage canal to dewater a much larger area than the old Maricopa County drainage district had. It was like 14 square miles larger. And there was an unprecedented flow of effluent being put in the Tempe drainage canal. Now, the Salt River Valley Water Users Association uh, tried to address this problem by extending the, the drainage canal across the reservation and dumping the excess effluent into, directly into the Gila River. And this was called the Gila Drain. It was built about 1923 and 24. But at other times, so on one hand, they could have this very large effluent running through the drain. But at other times, if the Salt River Valley Association decided that the land was dewatered enough, they could just turn off uh, they could just stop dewatering if the land was dry enough. So the flow of water through the drainage that Lincoln Fowler was so dependent on became very um, erratic or in, and couldn't be, um, couldn't be really counted on unless he paid a fee to the, to the Salt River Valley Water Users Association that would guarantee that he got money. And by some estimates, he may have been asked to pay as much as $4 per acre per year to pay for water. It was pretty steep, pretty steep fee. Um, so with these problems brewing, the collapse of the cotton market, the irregularities in the water and the increased fees, uh, Lincoln Fowler up and died. In 1924, September 1924, he was found collapsed in his room at the Arizona Club. And the newspaper reported that he had died of an apoplectic stroke. And I think they meant an apoplectic stroke. <laughs> but anyway, there he was. And uh, having died two years short of his contract, he kind of left things in a very unsettled state. And it sparked a rather acrimonious debate amongst his uh, his estate administrator and the, the government on the other side uh, about the, the future and the status of leasing on a reservation. Um, the Office of Indian Affairs fired the first salvo by saying, well, you know, he died, and we were expecting income for uh, 
couple more years on this, a dollar twenty-five an acre for a couple more years, and the two wells that he put in never worked properly, and he never put up fencing among the uh, the individual Indian allotments. Something he was supposed to do at the end of his contract. He didn't do all the stuff, and. Um, and on the other hand, the estate administrator came back and said, well, you know, there's no money. When he started the project, he had about $75,000 to $100,000 of personal assets, but he used virtually all of them building this irrigation project. So the next salvo was, followed, was uh, fired by the, uh, the government side, and they, they said, well, you know, when we tally up all the things that we're expecting, all the things we didn't do, he owes us $86,000. And uh, Valley National Bank, no, the Valley Bank of Phoenix, it was called, uh, came back and said, well, how about 5000 So there was a tremendous, <laughs> tremendous gap between what was asked for and, and what was uh, apparently available. And with the, the situation apparently deadlocked, Carl Hayden, again, was asked by the, he was asked, to get involved, and this time by the estate administrator. And in reviewing the information, he felt that um, Fowler's estate should be um, not required to pay so much money because he had installed an irrigation system that was flawed in some ways, but he had done that for the future benefit of the Native Americans. And uh, so after that, the Office of Indian Affairs and the Indian Irrigation System dropped its estimate from 86,000 down to 31,000. And Carl T. Hayden again got involved. And um, I'll read you his quote here. He, he said, I am now more firmly convinced that Fowler's heirs and bondsmen should not be penalized by requiring a strict performance of the contract in all of its details. As I understand the situation, only a few of the Alatis, those of the Native Americans, are either ready or willing to go upon their allotments and commence farming. If but few of them do, the entire tract of land will not be cultivated and will soon become an eyesore in the community. In my judgment, the best thing that could be done for the Indians would be to advertise the entire tract for lease to the highest responsible bidder who will pay a cash rent. So that's how the matter was settled. Um, the bank offered, it came up with apparently $12,500. Um, the Office of Indian Affairs accepted it, and the resolution of the matter marked the official end of the Fowler area, era. Now what's, I think, interesting about this is that during this debate that went on between the Office of Indian Affairs on one hand and um, Fowler's estate on the other, somehow the emphasis shifted from having an irrigation system that would be turned over to the Native Americans to an irrigation system that would be run pretty much forever by outsiders um, who would come in, place a bid, and, um, and manage the tract. Um, now this, the contracts that were drawn up between uh, the lessees and the federal government did change. Uh, later on, they were the proceeds from this $1.25 per acre or fee, whatever it was at the time, went to the Indian Alatis. It wasn't simply kept by the government. It, did, it was passed on to the Indian Alatis. Um, it did make them through time more dependent on a cash economy. Uh, both the, the passive fees that they were getting, the passive income, if you call it, that they were getting from rental of lands, and also people who would work doing labor on the farm. Um, the size of the lease tract changed through time. It's currently up to about 2,750 acres. Although the size of it changed in response to different factors of the day, uh, the idea of the lease tract became institutionalized. And by the end of the historic period, there were something like uh, 10 other leases in the northern borderlands of the Gila River Indian Reservation, all of them over 500 acres each. Uh, so that's kind of how this came about, and um, that's the end of my story. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Yes. Yeah.
We're in the desert, but I'm trying to figure out where the water came from. Was in the Kennedy ditch? Mm -hmm. Is there a dam somewhere or a river? Or well, let's see. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, the question was, where did the water come from for the Tempe drainage ditch? Yeah. And it was, well, the Tempe drain, the farmers who, uh, the white farmers who were uh, affected by the waterlogged lands were located south of Tempe but north of the reservation. And the drainage ditch was <coughs> was draining those lands. Well, by that date, by that date, there were several canals out there that were being subsumed under the, they're gradually coming under the Salt River Valley Water Users Association once the uh, Roosevelt Dam was completed in 1911. So there was, there was some unregulated surplus water out there for a while. Yes. Do I see a question from Tom Sheridan? <laughs> An excellent question. The question was, was Lincoln Fowler related to Benjamin Fowler, who was the, one of the leading people in the Salt River Valley Water Users Association? And he's also, that uh, Benjamin Fowler is also considered by some to be um, the father of the U.S. the Federal Reclamation Act. And um, the, the answer, well, there's sort of two questions in there. Was he closely related? And to that, I can confidently say, no, he wasn't closely related. Um, I tracked the family tree back a couple of generations on Lincoln Fowler, and I found no close relationship there. But he could have been distantly related um, because Benjamin Fowler was born in Massachusetts. Um, as was Lincoln Fowler's grandfather. Um, Benjamin Fowler came to Arizona much later than this, uh, than the Frank, than Lincoln Fowler's family. Benjamin arrived in 1899, or so. So the question is, there was no close relation. And in looking through the papers of Lincoln Fowler, I found no mention of Benjamin Fowler. But there could have been some distant relationship there. Oh, anyone else? Question. Yes. Is there still uh, leasing going on? Because I've heard things about the Steel River and Colorado River. Are there still these major uh, Anglo operations? Do they still pay all of them today? Hopefully, we can a little bit more money. <laughs> oh, boy. Would I love to answer that? But I had such problems getting information from the, um, not, not from the regional office of the BIA or from the National Archives, of course, National Archives records are way back. But I really did have a lot of trouble getting current information from the FEMA agency of the BIA. And um, I tried twice, I set up appointments with people um, to look at some records, mostly to see who had been the recent uh, lessees for the Fowler tract, the Broad Acres tract, it's called now. And I set up appointments, and I would go down there from Flagstaff, and I meet at Sacatone expecting to talk to people. And uh, a couple of times, the people wouldn't be there. And I'd ask, where are they? They're gone. And then uh, I wrote a letter. No, let's see, on the next try, I did succeed in beginning to talk to someone there, and they say, oh, that's a FOIA request. Well, I don't use that acronym FOIA a lot, but that's Freedom of Information Act request. So I started to, with the, the help of the um, Cultural Resource Management Program at Gila River, uh, the Indian side, not the government side, you know, the federal government, um, started to draft a FOIA request. And at that point, they said, oh, no, you don't need a FOIA request. Just come mm -hmm. over, and we'll provide you with what you need. So I went over there, and um, uh, there was a man who talked to me about it, but I couldn't actually look at any records. 
So I don't really know how that whole situation is handled today. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank all of you. And remember, you have a uh, little evaluation form on your table. And we will be back probably in the third Tuesday in February. So same place, no karaoke, continuing this process. And uh, again, you can still do make sure that you connect with your waiter. Um, we do want to get everyone uh, to pay their bills and, uh, and enjoy chatting with the people who are sitting next to you. So thanks again.